Hi, my name is Jordan Ramirez, and we are fortunate enough for this special episode of Film Talk with Jordan Ramirez to have a special guest today. He is a founder, director, and CEO at Meta Association. He is a screenwriter and producer at Andy Costa Films, and he is a certified life coach at Becoming Unafraid. Please welcome to the podcast, George P. Brooks. It's good to see you here. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Good. Now, the film that George has selected for today's podcast episode is from 1954, Seven Samurai, directed by Akira Kurosawa, starring the legendary Toshiro Mifune, Takashi Shimura, and Keiko, Sushi, and Keiko Tsushima. So the question that I always ask my other guests on the podcast is, uh, when did you first see this film and uh, why did you choose it? Uh, I, it, it was a film that, well, first of all, let me say this. I'm, I'm a self-admitted uh, otaku, mm-hmm. comic book geek, anime geek. Uh, during the time when I first saw this film, I was actually managing an anime store in college. Oh, oh wow. And it, it was a movie that I always uh, heard brought up over the years. Mm-hmm. And I think the first reference I saw for it was for, in James O'Barr's The Crow comic book, he referenced Seven Samurai. So I said, one day I've got to see it. <laughs> and cool. uh it came on one night i recorded it uh, i recorded the three and a half hour version mm-hmm. um instead of the two hour version that was released and mm-hmm. i sat and watched it uh, mm-hmm. on a friday night and there were so many revelations i had in the movie and i've watched it there were periods over the years where i watched it every sunday mm-hmm. sort of like uh meditation because that's that's sort of the manliest purest movie i think i've seen in terms of what the characters motives and motivations were yeah um, uh, and we can and we'll i know we'll talk further in this about certain scenes but there's a certain earnestness in it mm-hmm. uh of course it's directed by kurosawa um and that film was sort of a gateway drug into his other works like uh your gym uh um uh, uh, Yojimbo. What, what is Yojimbo and Sanjiro? Uh, yes, that one. I, I, and so I've seen so many of them that I get the titles confused. But uh, mm-hmm. Ron was great. Uh, his um, a remake of that of King Lear. Oh and wow! Also Rashomon. That's the one I was. Oh thinking Rashomon. About. Yes. I'm sorry. I don't know how I forgot that one. That one was striking. Mm. It was more of a striking film and the imagery in that and just the the story structure in terms of you had three people giving a separate narrative and it was almost like a precursor to sort of a good a good mystery that that we kind of uh get a chance to enjoy nowadays so you know anybody whether you're a student of film or not should check out kurosawa's film so uh there's some other ones i i I do want to check out i I may do some i'm trying to get i want to get caught up on some anime and stuff this weekend so i may (laughs) throw a kurosawa film or something or a documentary about him in there but just seven samurai is is, to me it's 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 a film about brotherhood but it's a film about humility and like i say it being three and a half hours it touched on so many things and every scene had a purpose. Mm. There was, there's not a, there's not a scene there you can cut out and not lose some context into the greater narrative. Mm. And that's something that's very hard to achieve, you know, even with the greatest editor, even with the greatest foresight. So I, I can't think of a wasted scene. I can't think of anything of anything that I feel like by the end of it, we're not explored and resolved. Mm. So I, I, I don't want to call it the perfect film, but the way it's crafted definitely leave it to, leaves it uh, is up there. And, and plus, it got me into Mifune also, mm-hmm. into his work, and and realizing how brilliant uh, he was as an actor, and and just it just and and, and beyond also the samurai genre that he was so heavily uh, steeped in. But just seeing his performances um, and the relate watching and looking back at the relationship they had as filmmaker. And 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 Bohemian, <laughs> yeah. kind of a cool thing to to kind of see as well. Yeah. Um, all right. So now that we're moving on to when you first saw it, um, uh, let's talk some of let's talk some of the scenes that uh, you said are the most striking to you, and we can discuss a little bit about that. So, what are some of the standout scenes that uh, you felt were to you uh, the ones that you felt that was a connection to you or maybe that you just enjoyed most of all. Right. Uh, I can go to this movie. Uh, I, I really want to maybe one day do a running commentary on it. 
<laughs> but uh, the uh, the actually the opening scene because it was so simple. It was basically um, establishing shot of a village mm -hmm. and showing the people working. And the bandits right up said, "This is what we're going to take." And then you saw, I think the character's name is Yohei, arise yeah. from the crops, and, and he's basically like, "We are up shit creek." Mm -hmm. That set up the 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 MacGuffin pretty much is the safety of this village, and from that you were clear as to what. Okay, this is this 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 one few second scene set up perfectly the the farmer's motivation for the rest of the entire movie, and that's something that's so hard to do and so hard to encapsulate, and took a certain brilliance because nowadays we spend a lot of times we'll spend. Uh, the whole movie watching it and never really be clear on what the character's motives are. Mm. But that set it up perfectly. Okay, now we know their motives. Another scene uh, is because you have to care about why the characters are doing anything. Otherwise, you're just watching paint dry. Uh -huh. But another part was when they were recruiting the samurais and they were all staying at the inn. And um, they were, you know, all, they, all the villagers could offer was food to the samurai, was, mm -hmm. was rice every day. Yes. So, you know, and the, one of the bandits or one of the vagrants came up to him and said, look, you know, we've been watching these these farmers beg you to work for them for days now. They're giving you their best. And and when uh, when, when they realized, look, maybe we do need to endeavor this. Maybe that is enough because they are not truly giving us our best. They set up their motives. Why are the samurai into this? So a movie that it's like it's it's so perfect in, the, in terms of its outline. This character, this is their motives. We are, and actually one thing I left out in the fact that the beginning narrative kind of exposes what the what the uh, the, the the farmers' narratives are. Mm -hmm. It also exposes what the bandits' narratives are, which is the village. Mm. That's what they're after. Mm -hmm. But I love how beautifully later on in the movie they also give insight as to why the bandits are. Um, seeking out villages first of all they're ronin which is a mm. master of a samurai this this sort of takes place you know time wise during the end of the samurai class mm -hmm. or you know a lot of times this happened during during the prime of the samurai class you had master of samurai that became bandits because they were actually being hunted by some farmers you found out later on and i'm sorry if i'm spoiling it but you still got mm -hmm. it was 50 something is made in the 50s there's no spoiling it no <laughs> not at this <laughs> No, but um, they found out that the uh, that the that the farmers had been hunting samurai and using and and storing their weapons, and that gives motivation, uh, insight into the motivation of the bandits of why they are they're out there being hunted also. Mm. So it, it sets up beautifully character motivations, and if you write characters with clear motivations, then the story kind of writes itself. Mm. People think, what's the story I'm writing? It's not necessarily the story that you're crafting. It's more so the character. And if you craft the character and you craft the motivations and the inspirations of what, 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 what guides them, what pushes them, the story will will wrap it will write itself. Mm. That's good to hear because I I noticed that in I noticed that in the film, uh, you do get to see the different characteristics of each of the samurai and why uh, some of them were like after well some of the samurai that the farmers were trying to recruit as well as uh, Takashi Shimura's character who is sort of the leader uh right. th their motivations were basically we needed somebody who could respect the farmers and some of the samurai who were being offered to uh help out the farmers uh they were not in it for like food or anything they just wanted nobility and something like uh right. riches and and things like that and then you have like the others that uh were more sympathetic towards them as well as being uh as well as being uh saying you know i don't want any riches or fame or anything like that i want right. to help them out because after i heard their story um i feel like yeah this is a good cause and a good purpose and right. the one character uh and i thought he was like sort of the best scene stealer as uh as far as the other samurai Ufune. Yeah, let me uh, guess. Mifune. Right. Yeah, Mifune. He he is the best scene stealer in the film because he has some of the best lines. He has some of the best uh, motives, and uh, I don't know. I always thought of him as sort of like uh, e because each of the samurai has a different characteristic, and I always thought of him as sort of the uh, I don't know how else to describe his character, but like sort of like uh, the wild character of the bunch. Yeah, the wild dog of the, the of the pack. Yeah. And when you find out his motivations for kind of being kind of cynical toward the samurai, 
but yet cynical toward the 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 the, the farmers as well was beautifully executed mm -hmm. because when he came out to the other samurai i was like look you don't understand something these people are greedy petty they'll hunt you down to kill you underneath the floors they have rice beans salt cake i remember that last specifically <laughs> yes you know and he he broke down and he let you know you know you gotta understand something i was the child of a farmer this is what happened to me mm -hmm. this scene when he rescues the baby yes and um, he's like this this was me in the village it was it's like brought everything so full circuit circle because when you left when you, when you watch the last frame of the movie Mm -hmm. and you feel what you feel you feel you feel a uh, uh, a heaviness but you feel uh, a resolution in yourself that everything was wrapped up yeah. there are very few movies that it didn't leave you wanting more mm. that was good and yeah. so many movies now especially with the with the advent of big money franchises and mm -hmm. things you know there's always more and more let's pump out more of the same this, that movie was perfect and when they remade it which was blasphemous mm -hmm. because, why uh, yeah. At least, at least, at least do it in the same scope. At least mm -hmm. do it Lord of the Rings style. Yeah, you know, I, at least make it, at least make it epic. Um, so, you, you know, and and the thing, I guess I, I should rethink that because a movie like that doesn't need to be epic. You could film it on the soundstage. Yeah, or just, mm -hmm. that's that's the beauty of it too. Yeah, I mean, the I think the remake you mentioned was like the Magnificent Seven, the one that right, they, it was a remake of that. Yes. Yeah. Mm hmm. And I understand that um, the Seven Samurai film, as you mentioned, it's been referenced, it's been uh, talked about a lot, it's been discussed uh, more than almost every other film from the 50s period, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, this was my first time watching it, and I and I do understand why it's a three plus hour movie, and it's an epic, and it's also a character study because you get right. to see the different characters and you get to see the different motives and also because it's a historical film but it's also a great um uh adventure story as well it's what right. it's it's what motivates you to watch this type of story because um as you said we live in a we live in this era where big money makes these big franchises and sequels and remakes and all these sorts of stuff but when you watch some of the uh, films that were made from different periods and different eras and different uh, continents or different parts of the world, um, you get to see how story is being treated differently because story right. and character is what motivates us to uh, to like these types of movies, of course. And I think I think for me personally, I could see a part of myself in each character. Mm -hmm. I think the relatability of the movie, um, you you could understand even from. From 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 Kambe's perspective as the leader, de facto leader, down to Yohei, who was terrified of his own shadow. Mm -hmm. You know, you can understand each character and and what what motivated them. Even the guy with the daughter, yeah, cut all her hair off. You can in some way understand why he did what he did. Mm -hmm. So when you have characters that are relatable and, and accessible like this, like I said. It was a huge success. It was a big movie. But if you think about it, what it would take to film something, film that nowadays would be so minimalist. Mm -hmm. That fact that something, you know, that, that we can do so easily now created something so beautiful and so complete. Mm. That's that's a brilliant part of being involved in not only the filmmaking process, but the creative process as a whole. OK, well, that is that's that's how, that actually is good to know. Um, so this. So this question, it's a little bit off topic. So mm -hmm. what motivated you to become a writer and a producer at Andy Costa Films? So uh, were, were there any uh, film influences or was this something you wanted to do on your own, like in a journey? Part, part of a journey. Uh, I was always a writer, even from elementary school. I was in several writing competitions. I would write all the speeches for school programs in third and fourth grade. Uh, I was on the school newspaper for a while, um, and I wrote comic books during the big comic book boom of, of mm -hmm. the early 90s. I was a teenager, and I had stuff with DC I had going. And I'm actually going to be writing a web comic coming up. Oh, wow. That, that sounds and, cool. Yeah. So uh, with, with that, you get familiar with scripting. And I, I always realized I thought very uh, uh, cinematically when I would lay out my panels. And I've always been a movie buff. So some of the movies that did influence me. I'm a huge, huge, huge Batman fan. Oh wow! So you know, and I remember being in in the in the in the thrust of the 
in the crux of the 89 craze. <laughs> so that was influence on me. Uh, mm -hmm. Movies like the, um, and yeah, I keep in mind, I'm about 11 years old at the time. Okay. Oh, wow. Uh, Clockwork Orange, mm. uh, Full Metal Jacket. Mm. Wow. Um, a, a lot of Kubrick stuff. Um, a lot of anime, a oh, ton wow. of anime. <laughs> um, you know, e e anything Miyazaki did, Grave of the Fireflies is a movie that makes me emotional to this day. I think that was Takahata. Uh, uh, yeah, that was Takahata. Yeah, yeah, but but uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of the more pop anime like your Dragon Balls and your Roni Kenshin's. Mm -hmm. uh, huge fan of Berserk. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I say, huge Batman fan. A lot of Denny O'Neill's run from the seventies because, mm -hmm. like, when I was growing up, we didn't have a lot. But I was a comic book buff. I had like several hundred comic books, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I couldn't afford the graphic novel. So one thing I one thing I found out, you go to the library, you can check out all the graphic novels for free. So I was constantly reading something. Mm. Uh, I was constantly, I was a huge fan of Frank Miller before he went crazy. Mm. And uh, while I love anything Frank Miller wrote, and I, I feel like, um, I didn't want to say he went crazy, but before mm. he got more eccentric. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, he really influenced a lot of my writing style and people ask about my vocabulary. A lot of that came from reading comics and reading different kind of comics and and foreshadowing. So I've been a big fan of the comic book genre and I got to see it coming up at the, po at the, at the point where the genre really kind of came out and it really started. People always talk about this, when this kind of big boom of comic book movies start. And actually, your Wesley Snipes, because it really started with Blade. Mm, that. I don't think I ever saw Blade, but I do understand what you mean by the the rise of the comic book uh, movie uh, era, because yeah. I I grew up when the comic book movies uh, from DC and Marvel and all the some some independents, uh, they were hitting big in Hollywood. They were hitting big right. in Hollywood. And I don't. And also, I, I, too, am a huge anime buff. I've been right. Uh, I, I watched uh, when I was younger. Uh, the only block that I remembered that they used to have them, and I still think they have them today, was on Toonami on Cartoon Network. Right. See, see, here's the cool thing. See, yeah. I can tell you're a little bit younger than me. I'm about 45. Mm -hmm. See, I got into and I was born in 78. Mm -hmm. My sister got me into anime about 1984 when she went away to college on a music scholarship. She came back and told me about Robotech or Macross. Uh -huh. And it would come on locally at like 6.30 in the morning with Buck Rogers. And that's when I first got hooked on anime. Then over the years, I would watch Go Lion, which was Voltron. And then I started discovering, I had I was writing comic books uh, with a guy who did some stuff for Marvel, mm. who lived locally to, with me in Memphis. Mm. And uh, he introduced me into getting fan subs, which was fan sub projects back then. I had about a thousand videotapes. I'm a huge wow. Dragon Ball fan. Mm. And I actually got a job at an anime store, managing an anime store called Animax back in Memphis when I was mm. 18 and did that for a year. So I've been deep. I'm an OG anime fan. Mm -hmm. I remember the, our biggest deal, one of my biggest deals as an anime fan was when Gundam Wing was put on Toonami because that was the first time the anime had really been put on broadcast anime, broadcast TV, unedited. Mm -hmm. That was such a huge deal for me and my friends because at that time I was like 18, 19. Wow. And I got used to spending a bunch of money on videotapes. Because back then, when you would go buy anime, you bought it on videotape, you might get two 30 minute episodes and it would cost you maybe 60, 70 bucks. Mm. Wow. You know, for two 30 minute episodes. So me working at an anime store, I had a dual deck VCR. I had a couple of them set up. So anything, I got free rental. So every day I would rent this, something different, go home, record it. And I had stacks of blank videotapes. My mother even I got even got me a dual deck for for Christmas one year because she saw how I was building my anime collection. Mm. So um, I I I, I want to say I'm I'm not hopeful on Hollywood doing a a really good anime adaptation as far as live action. Now I tell you which ones are very good that I've seen. Mm -hmm. The Roni Kenshin ones are some okay. of the best. Oh, right. They are some of the best live action. I actually watched them with my youngest son, Caleb, who's uh, actually in his anime club in Memphis. He has all the Berserks. He's 13 and reading Berserk, mm. uh, which is pretty, pretty impressive. It is. Uh, he has a huge anime collection, manga collection. And what this leads to back in the filmmaking is that you learn how to think long term in terms of your storytelling. Mm. And me being a comic book fan, I think long term. And in, in terms of that, you learn to develop characters and build characters over time and do world building. 
world building is important. And the thing, beautiful thing about Seven Samurai is it clearly set you up in terms of you understanding what that world was like. And that's something that brought me into filmmaking. And that's something that brought me into it, being able to construct something in your own, in your own mind that's abstract, build your own world and put it, put it out there for, for people to consume. Mm -hmm. But uh, I started writing uh, somewhat professionally as a late teen. Uh, I took a break from it for a long time. I took a film course at Full Sail uh, a few years ago, got a film certificate and have been writing screenplays. I'm, I, I work with Andy Costa, who's an Emmy-winning producer in the DFW, a good friend mm -hmm. of mine. Um, so looking at reconnecting with him and working on some projects. Uh, Adwana Ayak, who, who's a film uh, uh, producer and director in Nigeria, is a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And she's released uh, some, some features. Uh, there was a movie called Just 13 that'll be airing soon. I have details on that uh, mm -hmm. coming up soon that I, help, uh, I helped out with. Mm. And she's got a show uh, that I will, um, if you follow my social media, I post links to it. Brilliant filmmaker doing a lot of great stuff over there in Nigeria. I'm looking at filming a documentary over there on mental health in 2025. Mm. Uh, I'm looking to work on a uh, old comic book project. I'm going to dust off from the age of 16 and make it to mm. like a superhero movie. Mm. But it'll be definitely different. I'm looking on that in 2025, 2026. Mm. So I've just got a lot of stuff on the horizon just in terms of film production. I've been doing a lot more acting mm. uh, lately. I just had a video shoot uh, yesterday. So I'm just I love I love what the power of filmmaking can do, but I understand it all starts with uh, someone with a vision, and uh, you 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 can't you can't cook any uh, five star dish without a recipe, mm -hmm. and I love writing I love creating, and that's how I got into all this. And I'm also trying to write comic books. I'm also writing my first book, which is a, a book about my life and my journey. So uh, I'm definitely writing. I hate the act of sitting down typing though. <laughs> So, uh, but I, I, I love the creating. So I'm doing a lot of stuff on voice recorder. I'm just re recording my rambling thoughts and putting them together uh, on the back end. So I'm trying different methods of getting kind of what's in here and my narrative and things I want to create out in a way that's going to be efficient for me. Mm, that's that sounds good. And I and um, I I do love the projects that you described um, so eloquently and so beautifully, and. Um, since I, I too am uh, trying to uh, look at other films and other uh, genres. Um, actually, that's how I try to uh, look at it from a cinematic point of view. Because when I, as you mentioned, when I look at comics and when I look at uh, other uh, international films, uh, that's basically how I see uh, films from a different perspective. I mean, I took a film class at HCC and I was introduced uh, not only to Kurosawa, but I was also introduced to uh, other filmmakers, uh, not just from the eight, not just from Japan, but also from Hong Kong, the Philippines, uh, other uh, Korea. Yeah, yeah, Korea, of course, is now like one of the huge uh, markets right now, especially on uh, streaming platforms like Netflix, Hulu, uh, some right. of the big companies in the United States. Um, but yeah, I, I try to see it from that perspective. But um, so what uh, what acting credits uh uh, you were mentioning you uh, just finished acting. Uh, what what is the name of the project? Uh, oh wow, uh, a lot of them haven't matriculated yet, uh, just because of timing. Um, there was a show, uh, and I will post all this on my social media uh, mm -hmm. as it comes out, but I don't want to say too much. Okay. But there were there were a couple episodes of a of a TV show that'll be coming out soon. There are a couple music videos, mm -hmm. um, and there are definitely more things on the horizon. And uh, I'm excited about it because it allows me to uh, to learn and experience a different facet of the filmmaking business mm. and uh, not just the business, but the creative aspect of it. So um, just just working, just working as hard as I can, trying to be able to do things I'm involved in. I actually work for a wrestling company also because I'm a mm. wrestling fan. Oh, wow. um, working with a media company about doing a web comic. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I got my hands at a lot of stuff, but I'm able to manage them all well. Mm. And it's kind of fun because everything I wanted to ever do as a kid, I'm kind of getting the chance to do. I mean, you get the chance to work in wrestling and write comics and fun stuff like that. Mm. And But I, I levy it with my nonprofit, with my more serious work, mm. uh, with my endeavors that are more about what God uh, has for me in terms of my purpose. So I'm able to kind of you know, have my cake and eat it too. And I'm enjoying that process. Mm. Uh, speaking of Miyazaki, did you get a chance to see his latest film? 
Not yet. I saw the commercial for it. I want to go and check it out. Uh, what's the name of it again? Uh, the Boy and the Heron. The Boy and the Heron. Yeah, I saw the commercial for it the other day, and I want to check it out. So mm. um, pretty much anything Miyazaki does is just because of the love put into it and mm -hmm. what he puts into it. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's brilliant. I'm looking forward to it. I'm a huge Dragon Ball fan. Love me to hate it. I don't care. <laughs> uh, but um, I was a fan of Dragon Ball back in the late 90s when it still came on. Mm. Uh, I think Sab Sab Saban was still doing the dubbing for it. Yeah, and um, I had all the fan subs. I uh, had all the illegal, co illegal <laughs> copies. Uh, you know, yeah. before anybody else did, and mm. that's how I got into Veroni Kenshin and Berserk. And I'm really behind on anime. I'm kind of ashamed, ashamed of myself. I've taken a hiatus, and my youngest son gives me hell for it. <laughs> but uh, some recent stuff, I, I enjoy Spy Hunter. Okay, some about Spy Hunter is really, really sweet. Uh, especially in the anime is well done, but there's something about the way they kind of their family kind of comes together. I find really spit sweet and sp spy family. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to check out the new Veroni Kenshin. I got a Crunchyroll subscription, mm -hmm. uh, and just what I love about anime is uh, many of the narratives and the different ways that you can express it. Um, I may be looking at doing some voice acting mm -hmm. uh, as, at some point as a, as as a possibility, but I I, I love the genre. Um, I, I I think I like one thing I do like. I think uh, you should see more companies take their film franchises and do animated films as, as well, like DC does with the DCEU. Yeah, uh, you know they're still releasing like the Batman, which was a brilliant film, mm -hmm. probably my favorite film right now because I'm biased on that. <laughs> but they, they also have a corresponding animated universe. But so I, I would stand to reason something like the Fast and the Furious. Why does not ha why does not ha that not have a corresponding animated division with it? You could bleed mm -hmm. that dry, mm -hmm. especially yeah. with the popularity of anime. There's a market for it. See, I just and I just gave that away for free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, but that that's something that I always wanted to listen to because I know that my podcast is called Film Talk, but. Uh, it, it doesn't just have to focus on film. It could also focus on different types of, right. uh, of entertainment and anime right. is, uh, is one of my favorite, uh, right. yeah, genres, of course, because, and, 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 I'm and, and, and I think it's important discussion to have because, uh, it's influencing it even influences the kind of projects I take on. And it's, it's good at creating, uh, a, a good, uh, depiction of how your outside influences can bleed over into your filmmaking and film production and the types of film that films that you like. I don't think if I were not an otaku, mm -hmm. if I were not a comic book, I don't think I would feel the affinity that I feel for Seven Samurai. Yeah. Um, but yeah, of course. I mean, uh, in terms of different filmmakers from Japan, um, I like Kurosawa and I do have so somewhat of a soft spot when it comes to other filmmakers from Japan. Mm -hmm. Um, I am a huge Yasujiro Ozu fan. I like right. I like Ozu because his films are more about family oriented uh, characters and stories. I have another I have a film by Kenji Mizoguchi. Uh, I think it's called Okaru or something like that. Uh, mm. It's a really good film. It's a sort of ghost story film. And then in terms of anime, I mean, I've been caught up on all these other uh all these other new animated shows. I've been uh, so caught up lately. I've been trying to uh, catch whatever episode I might have right, missed from. Right. But yeah, um, I, I declare myself as somewhat of an otaku myself. Um, right. I mean, I grew up in an era when uh, you had friend, you had like uh, four kids, and they had like the Pokemon uh, shows right. that were coming out, and you had Yu-Gi-Ohs and Digimon's and all those sort of stuff. I grew up in that era in the late 90s and early 2000s. And uh, I could relate to that too, because that was the year right. I grew up in. And see, it was funny for me because during that time, I was actually working in the industry. I also had an online uh, uh, store selling anime uh, products and DVDs. I had my wholesale license and all that. Mm -hmm. I was working at an anime store. I was doing writing. So I was actually working in the industry. I managed the GameStop for a long time in my mm -hmm. early 20s. Uh, proud to say uh so i i, I was kind of in on the back end of the gaming and the anime and anime and i i was one of those guys that was into e3 and all that so at a time when you were entering i was very steeped into it and it's just funny to me seeing how much it changed mm -hmm. because the stuff i'm into you would get uh ostracized for it 
<laughs> when I was coming up. Like it's like, and I was proud about my 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 geekdom. Mm. That's that's a plug for geekdom one hundred and one, Danny. That's a yeah. plug for, for my geekdom is uh is is the fact that I was proud of it. You know what I'm saying? I take my comic books to school and read them at lunch. I didn't care. <laughs> uh, I, I talked about stuff, you know, and you know it just wasn't cool. It was secretly cool. That was the thing. Mm -hmm. the, the quote unquote cool kids, they they might tease you for it out in mm -hmm. public, but then they pull you up and say, Hey, can I see that comic book you had? I like that. <laughs> what I saw was it was always like that. Mm -hmm. And now people can be open about everything. And the black geekdom is, is sort of his own genre. And you're gonna see that more in terms of a lot of young black filmmakers coming up. That you're gonna see that 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 Marvel uh universe influence, you're gonna see the influence of the DCEU. Uh, that's why I think it's careful, you know, especially those that endeavor to make comic book films to make sure they're trying to produce something of quality because it's going to have such a heavy influence on future filmmakers. And you got to understand what kind of impression do you want to leave at that point, mm. you know, as a filmmaker? Yeah, you're like, the, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to hear how the Brave and the Bold, the new Batman film is going to turn out because I know it's going to influence film, uh, <laughs> influence filmmaking. filmmaking. Yes. And one way you can see that there have been some really good fan films made. Mm. I think with 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 I think it's I think this time right now is so fertile for filmmakers because there's so many different distribution avenues to pursue. Mm. And you can basically, if you have an updated iPhone, you can film, you know, a movie and edit it on your phone. And that kind of accessibility has lent itself to a lot of like fan made Batman films, some of which are very good. Mm. Or for what they are, some of which are wow, very bad. <laughs> it shouldn't be. So you know, but it, at least it allows creators to. You know, I would love to do one. Mm -hmm. uh, someone wants to get involved in one. I would love to do it. I'm in the DFW. I'd love to do a, a fan made Batman film. Mm -hmm. uh, but just because that shows you again how my 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 uh, my 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 fandom of, of of Batman influences what I do film wise. And 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 what I, the kind of projects I want to take on, the kind of writing I do as a as a film producer, and I'll be directing some things soon, and not just as a creator, but as a connoisseur. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, uh, some other movies I'm a, I'm fans. I'm think, trying to think of movies that if I'm flipping the station and mm -hmm. they're on, what am I going to stop? Color Purple mm -hmm. is one of them. Um, Did you get to see the new one? I have not seen the new one. Um, I'm not in the rest to see the new one. Okay. You know, like when they meet, we remade Seven Samurai and they in, it entered all the video game elements into it. And it was just like, oh my God, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> watching remakes. Because uh -huh. you got to think, has there ever really been a good remake? Mm, no, Film not, no, not that I can think of. It's almost like it's the same thing or... Uh, there are some that try to do it from a different perspective. Yeah. I mean, I'm somewhat, I'm somewhat a bit iffy when it comes to remakes or uh, yeah. adaptations. See, we could say The Magnificent Seven with Yul Brenner, mm -hmm. but that wasn't really a re remake. That was sort of a recrafting. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking of a straight remake, and I'm actually thinking, trying to see if I can think of one that was actually good. Mm. Uh, there may have been some that weren't vomit-inducing, but I'm not going to think there are any good ones. And that's the challenge. That's the challenge as filmmakers, because right now everybody's in the reboot phase. I, or have there been any good reboots? Mm, yep. There have uh, been some decent reboots, but no good remakes. So <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, maybe Hollywood should get the message and kind of stop retreading the tire, because at yeah. some point you got to change it. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, people talk about the monotony of, of comic book films and how it's bad for the film industry. How is it bad when it's just one genre? Mm -hmm. You know, it is. just don't, you know, I, I don't eat bananas, but I'm not saying bananas are ruined in the food market. I just don't eat that one thing because there's so much more to choose from. So people that kind of piss and moan about, you know, comic book films and it's just not it's just not what people want right now. No. You um... know? And, and, and I think, you know. People want what they want. I remember when a, uh, 89 Batman came out, Spike Lee was very uh, critical of it. Mm. And But why? It's just that people don't want to see what you're used to selling right now. It's a market. Yeah. And, and it, it's not it's not beholding to our creative whims. It's going to mm. change when it changes, when it wants to change, because people change. Yeah. But, you know, a, a certain trend in, 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 in the filmmaking industry or consumer market is not going to be levied by 
where you are in your life because now you want to paint in pastels instead of watercolors. Yeah. Um, so right now we're okay. So we're running, we're running a little bit on time. So we got like about four or three minutes left. So, all um, right. all right. So before we end the show, um, do you have any last statements or uh, anything related to uh, the movie or maybe the discussion we discussed so far? Um, if you're a filmmaker, get out there and create as much as possible. Um, I, I love to see high production value in TikToks because those are people that really have a, a passion, not only for the technical aspect of filmmaking, but the creative aspect of it. Um, and I, I, I think that it's going to give way to a lot more, um, a lot better films on an independent level. So follow your dreams. If that's your dream, follow it. It doesn't care what, what, what it is. If you want to be a carpet layer, be the best one you can be, pursue that. And my overall message is to try to treat each other better, try to be more patient with each other, and just try to make this world a better place. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And, thank you. Um, and I'll, I'll say one thing about the comic books. Um, um, you mentioned that you have a, a large array of comic books. Uh, my my dad is a huge comic book fan. He loves DC. He loves Marvel. And he told right. me uh, when he was in Peru uh, at a very young age, he used to watch anime. He used to watch anime on their uh, local TV stations. In right, China. right. Hmm. Um, but yeah. Right. Um, so uh, can you uh, let us know about the upcoming projects and also the webcomic that you're uh, in the middle of doing so before the show ends? Well, right now it's in very early development, but you can follow my social media at George P. Brooks on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and also my nonprofit is Meta Association. We focus on black male mental health, fighting recidivism and promoting fatherhood. We'll have a new site up in the next few days. It'll be at Meta, M-E-T-T-A Association.org. And also, if you need a public speaker, collaborator on any efforts or need to talk about anything, you can give me a call at 901-631-4300. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you. that yes. Okay, and that concludes our episode with George P. Brooks, writer and producer of Danny Costa Films, and as you as he has mentioned before, founder, director, CEO at Meta Association, and of course a certified life coach at Becoming Unafraid. And thank you for joining us. And I hope that we meet each other soon. And uh <laughs> sorry right. and uh i hope we meet each other soon and uh thank you for your time and thank uh, you yes thank you and i'll see you soon this was fun you have a good one you too thank you so All much right. mm -hmm. bye